Welcome to the HMO Property Show by investors for investors. Brought to you by the HMO Property Co., Australia's leaders in impact investing. Investments made with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a positive financial return. Catch us weekly as we discuss all things cash flow positive property investing. Welcome back to the Here Tomorrow Property Show. I'm your host as always, Neil Gibb, and keeping the floor going and bringing you experts from all around the country to speak to or listen to and hear how they have built their businesses and how you as an investor can use their services or learn from them to sharpen your own skills and go out there and implement yourself. I've got the Australian expert property negotiator, Mr. Scott Agate from Hello House. Scott, welcome to the podcast. G'day, Neil. Thanks for having me, mate. How are you doing? I am going very well, thank you, mate. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm sweating it out, mate. 34 degrees on the sunny Gold Coast. Oof. Well, 34 degrees there is 34, 37. 34. 34, 34 not enough. I don't want 37. It's a humidity <laughs> over there that gets me, mate. I just can't handle it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you might excuse my sweat beads as they roll off while we're chatting. <laughs> um, mate, thank you, firstly, for uh, coming on the podcast. I know you're a busy man. Um, no we've been The last few podcasts, we've been teaching property investors how to build their own property business. And we've done everything from normally down deals. We've done things like how to build an, an outsource team to support you build systems and processes so that you can scale your business. Uh, and I think one of the things that's been lacking and a lot of things that people don't understand is how important negotiation is when you're trying to build a property portfolio. So I thought I'd get you on and we'd have a little chat about how how you've got into this space because it's a very unique space. You're not really a buyer's agent, are you? You're more of a, you come in and just negotiate on the properties. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, we've got a full service solution, but we've gone to great lengths to set ourselves apart from being a traditional buyer's agent. And we can dig into what that means um, if you want to go into that in further detail. But yeah, we've, we've got a low cost solution for people. I would say it's a done with them service rather than a done for them service. Uh, and we really focus on a team of experts that are all ex-valuers, ex-real estate agents, um, deep domain experience, career, uh, long careers in each of those specific skill sets. And then we wrap around the buyer who is currently, you know, going it alone or doing it themselves, whether they're buying their own investment property or um, their principal place of residence. So it's a bit of a unique hybrid hybrid business. Yeah, it is very unique, isn't it? I think, are you, I, I don't know of any other companies in the market that offer what you offer. Um, there's, Like you said, there's a lot of buyers agents out there. Um, but uh, from what I understand, there's not many negotiators. There might be things, uh, negotiators that come into business deals, but I've never really heard of it in the in the property space, which is uh, very interesting. Yeah, well, I looked at um, different industries five and a half years ago when I set the business up. And obviously my skill set coming from 25 years as a leading agent in Sydney and in London was um, very much around the nuts and bolts of doing deals, working on the buy side and the sell side. So I really understood that space and I looked around at, you know, where are the negotiation as a service um, you know, is used in different industries. And it's obviously big in um, different parts of the world. And it might be, you know, in software or other different types of industry. Um, and, and I thought, you know, negotiation as a service would work really well. And it would work really well in Australia because we've been really slow on the adoption of buyer's agents. So um, there's no real good figures, Neil, around this publicly, but um, the sort of general consensus in Australia that I keep hearing from different property experts is circa 3% of people outsource to use a buyer's agent. So there's 97% uh, of Australians are currently doing it themselves, whether they're buying their own home or investment. So we squarely looked at that opportunity and thought, well, the, the, the total addressable market here is 97% of Australians buying property. It's not the 3% using a buyer's agent. How do I go about building a business that transforms the way Australians purchase property? How can I coach them in with the tricks and the tips and strategies that I know to find properties faster and then build analysis and negotiation around it? Because analysis and negotiation are two things that are very much a learnt skill. It's not something that you can pick up and buy one property or five properties and be a gun valuer or analyst. Um, and you certainly don't learn those skills very quickly as a as a negotiator. There's, you know, in my 25 years as an agent, I would have done north of three and a half thousand property deals. So it's wow. just a lot of um, learnings and mistakes on the run and um, understanding what's the right percentage play to pull and when. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And you said you worked in Sydney and London there too. Yeah, I did. Um, 
I did three or four years in Sydney uh, where I grew up, but I left school after I got licensed and then went to London and did that for five years as, a, as an agent there in central London in Islington and Highbury and then in Clerkenwell, if you know that area well. Mm. Um, so nice sort of um, high ticket value property. And then I came back to Sydney and I was the founder of the first three Bell property offices in the eastern suburbs in Sydney. Uh, so I did that for 12 to 15 years. I can't remember how long it was, but I've had the three franchises and then got out about eight years ago, moved the family to Queensland. We moved to the Gold Coast um, for a lifestyle change. And then I've been developing up here as well. So in seven years, we've done seven different houses up here. So I've got a bit of an idea of how that world works. Yeah. Um, I love architecture and design. So I've, I've, I've flipped a few properties, bought a few things in Japan and in the UK and done a lot in Australia. So I've got good rounded experience in terms of that. I wouldn't say I'm, an, I'm still definitely learning on all the development stuff and I'd be out of my depth in terms of what you do with your very niche skill in terms of how you add value to your clients and on your journey. Um, but mine's very broadly around the nuts and bolts of the transaction. So I think I'm you know, well-versed in that to add a lot of value to people and help coach people into um, doing it better. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I will say on that, Scott, is the, the lessons in development never end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Never end, mate. Yeah, it's, uh, every project we still do, there's always still a lesson in there. So, yeah. um, so transitioning from London, uh, Sydney to London, London to the Goldie, uh, setting up over there, how long ago did you set up Hello House and how did you get your, your name out there to let people know that it existed? Yeah, so the business is five and a half years old. Um, so I had a couple of years off in between uh, getting out of the game just to sort of recharge the batteries. And I did a um, ski lodge hotel business in Japan with a mate of mine from Sydney just for a bit of fun as a side project. And we've still got that. We built up to three ski lodge hotels in Nagano. And we still go and enjoy that for sort of a month or so every winter with the really? kids so at yeah. Christmas time. Yeah, which is good fun. Um, but then I had this burning ambition to build what became Hello House. And so probably for the last 10 years or so of being an agent, I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm bored of lying to buyers. I'm bored of lying to sellers. You can't win unless you're lying against your competitors in, in the market. So everyone's over quoting to win the listing. Everyone's under quoting to buyers to drive traffic there to create competition. And I just, I didn't, it didn't sit well with me and I was just bored of it. I'd done it for a long time and was, was frustrated by the process. So I kind of, I, I was watching the rise of buyers agents in Sydney um, back in the day and thinking, look, there's there's more smoke and mirrors in the buyer's agent game than there is on the real estate game. You know, the, the buyer's agents would come in and say, um, oh, I bought this property and I bought it below market value and I bought it off market. And I would say, well, you're the very definition of market value because you're the only one that paid the price. That's the first <laughs> issue. But second of all, their clients could never challenge them on whether or not they overpaid because it never went to the open public. So there'd be no domain for them to critique those prices. And, and we only sold to buyer's agents when we knew that they were going to pay an absolute premium with a cherry on top and we perceived that price to be greater than the price that we could achieve if we openly market the property online. Mm -hmm. So that was really why I thought there's a problem here, right? There's a real disconnect. The buyers are having a major problem. That's the first issue, buying homes in Australia. They're getting run around from the agents. They don't like the process. They're complaining to the agents all the time and I was, I was at the forefront of that. And then they're going and outsourcing and paying luxury tax to a buyer's agent who's doing exactly the same thing to them who they think is representing their best interest. So I watched that and I thought there has to be a better way, coupled with the fact that I was over it um, being a real estate agent and I wanted to focus on the thing that I loved, which is negotiation. So I'm like, how can I do what I love all day? How can I build a business where I don't need to meet any clients? I don't need to see any property. Um, I can work in T-shirt and shorts from home with the kids <laughs> and have a great quality of life and do do what I love. So it was lifestyle by design, Neil, that kind of, created the first um, incarnation of Hello House. And, and because of my learnings with watching how the buyer's agent side of it worked, I thought the way to beat this game is to build a transparent service that's performance driven and it's completely um, open. So clients can see what I'm doing in real time, go along the journey with me. And that transparency is just lacking in the real estate industry. It was then and it still is now. So Hello House has been really the beacon for that transparency. Um, and we really take our clients on a journey, which they love. They get involved as much as they want to, depending on how much time they've got, but they're learning the whole time. So I feel like we're educating our clients as we go through. Um, and that transparency really gauged um, what was the kind of catalyst, I should say, for me to set it up as a performance-based service to begin with. So that's how it started. I called it Australia's only no win, no fee negotiation service, um, which was a terrible idea. I was saving <laughs> clients lots of money, but um, I was just attracting bottom feeders. The more I advertised how much I was saving, the clients just set their target price lower because yep. I didn't want to pay. And it was a good learning curve for me to realize I don't know very much about business. I just know a lot about property. <laughs> um, so I, I quickly um, morphed into a paid retainer and a performance fee element 
Um, and that had a big impact on the business straight away. The, the business um, really took off and had some fantastic results. And I realized then I was attracting the right customers that really had skin in the game, wanted to buy, trusted the process. And I was getting some really great results for those people. And then that's morphed into the business that we see today, which is a much bigger business. We're buying probably eight to 10 properties a week for clients around the country. I'd still say we're a really small team, small expert team. And we've enjoyed that process, but we're, we're um, growing quickly organically through past clients and yeah, and, and, and uh, lots of happy customers, which is good, very rewarding way of doing it this time. Beautiful, beautiful. So you bring the clients on the journey. They get to see how you negotiate. You, they get to see the tips and tricks and all that type of stuff as you're going along the journey. Yeah, absolutely. All the yeah. time. So even if I'm bidding at an auction for a client and I personally, I don't like bidding at auction. Um, I love it myself as a contact sport, but my clients shouldn't be bidding at auction if we've done our job. Mm -hmm. It's just the occasional client that will engage us right in the third week of a campaign or at a point at which the property can't be um, secured prior. And at that point, I'll have um, you know the agent in one ear talking while I'm bidding on the phone, the buyer in the other ear on a merged call, and they'll listen to my entire dialogue start to finish, and they love that. So they actually hear how the agents talk to me, how I talk to the agents, how I control the negotiation process, and how I fight for their corner. And I think that's what really resonates with people. It's like there's multiple opportunities where I could have given in and paid more because it was inside their target price parameters, but they're seeing me fight for the money and, you know, take that personally in terms of trying to keep, you know, $1,000, 5000 50000 in their pocket. And it's their hard-earned money. And that's that's really what makes a difference, I think, to finding then, you know, a word-of-mouth business, an organic growth business. And that's been really, as I say, really rewarding. Yeah, nice, nice. We all know that the, the markets are driven by emotion. Right now, there's there's not a lot of property out there to buy, is there? I don't know what it's like over on the uh, Queensland there, but in Perth, we've got the record lowest amount of properties to purchase. Uh, I think we're sitting at about 3,000 houses, uh, 3,000 properties all up. That includes landing units. So I think we're sitting around 1,400 houses for sale in Western Australia. Yeah, wow. Which is yeah. crazy numbers at the minute. Um, and just before we hit record on this, we were talking about the amount of buyers agents that were coming over from the East Coast that are buying sight unseen and paying top dollar for these properties as well with just so they can get the client into something and the clients have also got the fear of missing out so they're thinking they're getting a good deal yeah it's pretty scary really like i had um uh i'll just give you some a, a rare insight that probably much of the public don't have a clue about what happens behind the scenes mm. you obviously seen a huge rise of buyers agents in australia and everyone's going from a barista to a buyers agent now and the focus on all the marketing seems to be how much money you can make, not what sort of impact you can have on someone's life or building wealth. It's all about how much money you can make in the short term. Um, one of the issues that I'm seeing now is we've got buyers agents that are paying us to do the negotiation work for them. They don't know how to negotiate. They've never done that. They might have bought a couple of properties themselves. That's a pretty horrible situation to end up in in Australia. And I think it's incredibly dangerous um, times. But in terms of the um, Western Australia example and the low stock level that you just explained, what we're seeing on the ground is that we're buying properties in those locations as well. And we're competing with exactly what you just said, people buying them sight unseen and paying through the, through the nose. One buyer's agent recently said to me, um, only in the last three or four weeks, um, can you help me negotiate? I don't know how to negotiate for owner occupiers, um, but I'm, I'm really good with investors. I said, okay, well, what's the difference? Enlighten me. And she said, oh, well, it's investors are easy. I said, oh, what's the difference though between an owner occupier and an investor when you're negotiating? And she said, oh, well, investors just buy, you know, they'll just pay whatever price they, they, they have to based on the yield, whereas the owner occupiers, they, you know, they really want, you know, to fight for, for the best price. And I'm like, but shouldn't you be doing that for all of your clients? Like, they're both exactly the same thing. You, you, like, so this is the sort of laziness that we're dealing with. The people are just blindly paying whatever number they have to pay once they've convinced someone of a certain yield rather than fighting for an extra five grand, 50 grand, whatever that number is. So it is pretty scary, but, yeah, those low, low stock levels – are making um, things pretty crazed in your your hood. I would say though that even today I had a client um, sort of say to us, look, I don't think a pre and off market strategy will work for me in Sydney because this is Sydney, mate. Like you don't you don't really know much about Sydney. Like Perth, Perth or somewhere else that might work, but in Sydney it's not going to work. And I, I sort of said to him, well, what do you mean I don't know much about Sydney? Like I'm from there and my entire working career is there and I buy two to three houses there a week. Um, but why wouldn't I know that pre and off market strategy works? Oh, well, everyone here just wants the same type of property with the same budget. So what's the motivation for an agent to sell to them? And I think this is a misconception. Buyers don't really understand how the industry actually works from the inside out. And they don't realise the tips and tricks they need to put in play to give themselves an advantage. They can do all of this for free. They don't need to outsource it to a professional. 
um, they can definitely find some, you know, great value tips to put them on the right path to finding things pre and off market. As you addressed up front, that will put them in a much better position because they can um, negotiate some savings. Um, they can reduce their days on market and they can see more, more buyer choice that, you know, wider stock um, is going to give them, you know, better opportunity to find better sites, you know, or, or more profitable um, developments that you guys are doing. So it's, it's crucially important. And they can learn these things once they learn them, their life skills. Um, and they can apply them. And if they want to outsource for analysis or negotiation, they can do that at a low cost. So yeah. I firmly believe that's where the market needs to go. Mm, nice, nice. Hopefully you're going to share some of these tips with us uh, further on the podcast, Scott. But what I'd like to know they're, is, you've said that. They're behind like, the paywall. They're behind the paywall, mate. You need to, you need to pay more for it. <laughs> Earlier on, you said that some people engage you really early in the process and then some people uh, engage you three weeks into the campaign as well. Obviously, when you're three weeks into a campaign, there's a lot more pressure, less time to prep. What's your what's the process that you'll go through to prepare for a negotiation at an early stage compared to so far into a campaign? I don't think it really changes, to be honest, for us. Um, I mean, in terms of the client journey, just to address that part first, uh, we always start with strategy first. So we understand really what the client's looking for. We define the buyer brief incredibly tight. We'll reduce their wide net that they're looking in to make sure they're laser focused down to two or three core suburbs of interest. And then we'll build that off market and pre market strategy. So, to answer the question, then, in terms of how does that negotiation strategy look at an earlier stage in the campaign versus um, you know, something that's thrown at us at the 12th hour or the 11th hour, it actually doesn't really change. The process is the same. If you put a property in front of us on any given day, we'd have an analysis back to you that's incredibly detailed and transparent within two hours typically from our team. Um, our analysis, we track every single sale result. So we're tracking um, every property, whether we landed it or whether it sold to another party, uh, whether our buyers pulled out or they tried to go for it. So we're looking at what we estimated it versus what the eventual sale price. Our last three months has been 0.36% away from the eventual sale price. So we've got incredibly um, accurate analysis and we can do that quickly. So that never changes. We want to put um, a lot of detail emphasis into the type of asset we're buying, the due diligence around the asset, comparable sales, competing listings. Um, we're looking at uh, when it last sold, growth rates, um, how it's performed against other properties in that suburb, days on market, buyer sediment, like what confidence levels are in the market. That's how we arrive at where the analysis um, needs to be really accurately. And then the same thing applies for me at any stage, speed kills. And you may have heard me talk about this previously because you and I have met um, you know, before when I've done a few different talks um, and I talk a lot about how speed is paramount to buying success. So that doesn't change whether you're one-on-one -on -one with a motivated seller off market or whether you're dealing through an agent or whether you're trying to buy prior to auction and you're two or three weeks into that campaign. We want to get our ducks lined up really quickly. It's not rushing. It's understanding the steps of the buying process and then navigating through that buying process with speed. And the goal for that, Neil, is to knock out as much buyer competition as you can and don't leave um, enough space for anyone to compete against you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really change too much for us. It's a pretty similar approach um, either way when we're buying. Interesting. Interesting. So when you say speed kills as well, um, can a fast deal or a fast offer kill a deal that should be drawn out as well as a slow offer can kill a deal that needs to be done fast? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's a good way to put it. And it's absolutely accurate. I'm generalizing um, that speed kills because that's the 99% of the deals that I would say we do, but you're absolutely right. There's some deals that we just have to play the long game on um, and some deals that you can obviously push really quickly. And um, if there's an opportunity, we drive a stake through that, you know, that open door really, really quickly. Um, it's horses for courses, right? Like you just got to work out the right opportunity. Some people need time on the market to realize they're overpriced. Mm. I think a lot of that heavy lifting though can be done in good negotiation rather than waiting. I think if you wait, um, which possibly maybe a more inexperienced buyer would do if the agent tells them, look, mate, we need, we need another two weeks of, in, of, of in open for inspections or we need some more buyers through the door to get some market feedback. I think a good negotiator can alleviate that by saying, um, you know, there might be different tools that I would use at that point. And it might be along the lines of, okay, Neil, that's great that you want to wait, but, um, you know, now I'm going to introduce leverage against you. Um, now I'm going to go to town on pricing to understand where your client is at, where the comparable sales evidence at, where the competing listings are at. I'm going to, you know, furnish you with a matter of, you know, hours, a whole heap of information that gives you a compelling reason why what we're offering is fair and that you should turn around to your client and give them instructions that if they want to sell, today's the day. So I'll try and drive that as hard as I can, um, but it can't always be done. Sometimes, you know, the clients are in la-la land or the agent's dick. 
Um, there's plenty of the latter <laughs> and plenty, plenty of the former. <laughs> 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 um, you mentioned something there it's just slipped from my mind. So we're, we're in there negotiating. <clears throat> um, do you... God, I've lost the question I was going to ask you there, Scott, because when you said they're the agent, <laughs> too many things, yeah, sometimes it's both, isn't it? So unrealistic sellers, that was it. Unrealistic sellers, are you seeing them a lot in the market now? And are you seeing uh, different versions of unrealistic in different states, depending on where the market's at in that area? Uh, we do, yeah, we do. I think it's fair to say that you you see a balance of it right across the country. It doesn't. It's not sort of geographically divided. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting I think a lot of it to do is what I said and addressed up front is that it's agents that are over quoting to win the listing. Yeah. Uh, so much of this is driven by the agents themselves that create their own hole. Um, and then you've got the situation where they're under quoting to buyers. So even when that's at play, you still get these out of line results or well, not out of line results, but out of line expectations from sellers that they're chasing a huge number. But I think a lot of that is inflated by uh, the agents themselves. So part of what we do, Neil, probably 20% of my day is agent selecting. So we'll work with people that are selling a property, whether it's their principal place of residence or it's an investment property, and we'll run an agent selection process. And we start by you know, running a deep analysis on the, on the individual's property so we can take that element, exactly what you just referred to, out of the game. So if you say to me, Scott, I want to sell this property in you know, 210 whoop whoop, and it's, um, I think it's you know, the agents that come through and there's four people I've spoken to and they've all told me it's, it's going to range between 550 and 650. We would have gone in before that and said, um, this Neil, your house is not worth a dollar more than five ten. Um, maybe in competition, you might get lucky with a little bit more than that. But the comparables will only support that. So, from a bank valuation perspective, you'll struggle to get much higher than that number. We think. Um, and then, when you start that process, when you speak to the agents, any of them coming in and telling you you're going to get six fifty, you know they're just blowing sunshine, <laughs> and you're you, you know that's unrealistic. So we take those clients out of that headspace and get them back to reality. Now, if they want to sell. Of course, we're going to try and get the absolute best result for them and maximise that dollar, but it just takes out that guesswork. Unfortunately, for the vast majority of the clients that are going it alone, people that are doing or consumers going alone in Australia, they're sucked in, they're baited by that. The agents know that if they, you know, throw a big number out there, Neil, your place is worth six fifty when you thought it might have been worth five fifty, your ears prick up and you think, oh well, I'll give this person, you know, another shot at it, or I'll give them a bit another hour to keep talking, whatever, because they honestly believe in my property more than. Jenny does at you know Ray White or Chris does down at PRD, um, and it's all just hype and fluff. And that's the game that got me out of, of real estate is like this this constant battle of your competitors lying, and you couldn't tell the truth and win. That's where it got to, and I just I hated that process. Other agents will tell you differently, but I think they're full of shit. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. um, it, there's a lot of people, a lot of new people coming into this space now. They're obviously the property market's hot. A lot of people starting off in the renovation flip space as well. Um, yep. And, you know, maybe the first or second flip that they've done, they're looking out there to engage agents. They obviously haven't spoken to you. They're just going to go it alone. <clears throat> they might speak to three agents and get three totally different prices. If they haven't got the experience to do the, the DD that you would do, what DD could they do on the agents to make sure that what they're presenting them is the right information? Uh, well, I think you could do an independent bank valuation on a property before you bought it, if you wanted to. That would give you... Um, you know, some idea of where you accurately should price it so you don't get carried away. Or you could outsource it to someone to do an analysis on it for you. So uh, we, we, we offer that service at a very low cost, like in a couple hundred you know dollars range uh, to people that want to do that analysis. So they can have that back on the same day to say, okay, confidently I can go to 570 on this and not get carried away beyond that, walk away if there's, you know, then you can build your fees out around that number and have some confidence around it. But doing it themselves, um, I do think it's a skilled um, process that you know to learn valuation we touched on the kind of key things that we look for in a property so if they went away and wrote those down uh, and really sort of studied those you, you know it's something that you can learn and, and get better at over time it's just practice it's just time in the seat it's repetition same with negotiation you've just got to do it lots and lots and lots so I think the problem is for most people they don't have time to be finding the right assets learning how to analyze, learning how to negotiation, doing the building work or overseeing the, the FISO and actually project managing something, handling the sale, looking for the next site. Like if you're doing that as a full-time business, um, it's probably worth outsourcing that to an expert to know that you're not going to overpay um, and just get your time back, right? But it's up to up to an individual. You can keep practicing and learn those skills over time. 
Mm. We did speak about that in the last podcast did podcast I did with Cheryl Long about what we could outsource, outsource your weaknesses. And I think you mentioned there's a couple of hundred books to get the the report back on what the property could be worth once it's finished. Is that what you said? Yep. And a lot faster than, than using a valuer, um, a lot cheaper than using a valuer, and I think uh, incredibly accurate to do with market value, you know, what you're really going to have to pay if it's on the open market. So uh, I think um, that's a really good thing that you can probably outsource for less than 300 bucks and have it back on the same day. Fantastic. So if somebody's, let's say they, they've got a property, they've got their eye in it, it's a flipper, they want to pay 450 for it, they could reach out to you guys pre-purchase to get the report done on it. Could you then forecast what yep. that would be worth once it's complete if they give you the spec of the renovation that they're going to do to it? Yep, we do an estimate on, on what it was worth at the other end to give you both numbers. Beauty. So it's yep. instead of guessing the purchase price and guessing the sale price, you're getting some pretty accurate feedback from an expert in the market. Yep, so yep. it's low cost, that's easy to do, and uh, and we'll give you the formula in terms of how we do it so you can be learning the whole time, right? Or you can say, okay, great, well, I'll go and practice this between this and the next one and see how accurate you can get it yourself. Beautiful. Is the specific software that you're using for that, is it RP Data or have you created your own software that pulls it? That's all up there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I outsource it to um, a, a trained financial planner and, and value us and, Sam, who sits next to me all day, and he's built a, a team of analysts below him that do do this work for us nationwide. So, really? yeah, deep domain experience, mate. So, I, I haven't I haven't got the time to do that in terms of learning those skills. I'm pretty accurate with it myself anyway, without Sam. But Sam's team can just get it um, more fine tuned than I can, and that allows me to focus on the things that I'm good at, which is the negotiation part of it. And Sam will be the first to tell you that they're two vastly different skills. So that's why I challenge anyone: if you're doing it yourself, like you've got to be. You know, you've got to be a better negotiator than me. You've got to be a better analyst than Sam or as good as, as us. To, otherwise, you're leaving money on the table, I think. <laughs> True. True. How do, you, how do you get – so are you just doing all the negotiating and then your team are doing the, the research and the, the analysis? Or have you got other negotiators out there as well that you've trained up? Uh, I've got two ex-licensed real estate agents with deep experience in that game that um, do the vast majority of the negotiation work with me. Yep. Um, so between the three of us, we, we cover off on all the deals that we do. Um, yeah, I think that's for the, for the amount of work that we're doing at the moment, we're, we're well and truly covered. Um, I will at some point um, launch a, a, a more premium service where uh, I'm handling the negotiation on probably properties that are exclusively over $3 million. Um, and I'll work in that sort of higher price point um, as as the business continues to grow. So that's kind of probably the next sort of service that will will roll out. So I think there's a big need for that where people are still got the ability to find their own property uh, and with our help find that faster and unearth better, better options. Um, but they are currently going it alone. Um, they would otherwise be outsourcing to a buyer's agent that might charge them two percent. So you know they might be looking at sixty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars plus for a fee and. Um, I think you know we can do a performance-driven negotiation service at a much cheaper cost than that that would allow me to work on those higher ticket sales as well. So that excites me working on those deals. And um, you know, I've had some big wins there where I've saved clients, you know, 500, 600, a million, million dollars. Um, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about as we've been talking to you, we've spoken a lot about price and how much money you've saved clients, but is the is winning negotiation always based on the price or is there also terms that are factored into some of these negotiations that, that you do? I think it's both, mate. They go hand in hand, really. But, I mean, price is paramount um, to most of our negotiation success. But it's got to be balanced with the, the, the right terms to meet the vendor's expectations and to put them into a position where they can sell. So... Part of the, a big part of what I do in terms of my negotiation is ask really good questions. You know, I, I like the saying, um, you know, play dumb games, win dumb prizes. And it's the same in real estate, you know, ask dumb questions and you, you don't win any prize, right? So you've got to ask the right questions. Um, in Sydney, as a real estate agent, people used to ask me, how many contracts have you got out? I'm like, well, it's got no relevance to it. <laughs> what I say next is just going to be misleading or, and I'm going to give you a number that doesn't sound like too much, but enough to create competition against you in your mind so I can get you to pay a premium. <laughs> it's the same thing. You've got to, you've got to think about why um, the seller uh, needs to sell, what's the most um, advantageous terms for them, and then match that up with obviously a fair price that's going to work for them. So it does balance the two of those things. I'll give you a really good real-life example of this. We bought a property on Thursday night in St Ives in Sydney, um, paid $3.15 million. We've done our estimate at 3.2 target price from the client was 3.2 
Um, we offered 3.15, which included over $30,000 worth of furniture, so TVs and outdoor kitchens mm-hmm. and things like that. The vendor wanted to leave behind because I asked them, what settlement do you want? Um, what inclusions and exclusions do you want to add to the contract? And they wanted to leave a whole heap of things behind. They were leaving a family house for 30 years and moving to Queensland. We competed with another buyer, was pre, pre-auction. Another person matched our price after we offered that number, came in at 3.15. But they tried to dictate terms. They said, well, we want January settlement instead of what the vendor wanted, which was December the 1st, um, or the start of December. And um, they never knew about any of the furniture, so they were just offering vacant possession for that. So the owners made a decision on the, on, on the night that the both offers came in at about 6 o'clock and said, well, we'll go with the offer that's at, um, that's, that's at the right date and it's including the furniture that we wanted to leave behind. So we ended up probably $80,000 ahead in that deal. Like we would have spent another 50000 um, and we had thirty thousand dollars worth of free gear chucked in. So, just asking a few good questions saved the client a lot of money, but it also won them the property. Most importantly, their dream home. Mm. So, yeah, it, it needs to be a factor into everything you do. Yeah, can you give us a few more case studies? Because that was a that was a good one. Oh, in terms of when the the, the right dates or the right terms? Oh, just, just some of the some of the negotiations that you've won recently. Um, how it started out, what you kind of discussed in the negotiation, how it panned out at the back end as well. I think probably the biggest thing for us that works very often, and I'm kind of giving away my insider tips here, but it's it's how and when you use these cards rather than just um, saying, you know, these are the tips that I use and I just apply them every time because it's not the case. Yeah. But the biggest one that's going to give value to your listeners is leverage. Um, leverage is the key because you know, leverage gives me the ability to create competition out of thin air. Um, it reverses the fear of loss. It drives, um, you know, time outcomes. Uh, and it puts us in a position where we're going to learn more by making an offer like that than you will. Um, and I don't mean you, I just mean the general public. Um, and how I do that might be, and you know, the first phone call that I make, the very first phone call when I just kind of try and establish what the owner wants, what the agent thinks the price is going to be, and just ask those key questions that I just discussed earlier, I'll ring up and say, hey, Neil, Scott Argett here, really interested in 12 Smith Street. Um, my client is uh, is thinking this is a great property on paper. It looks like it ticks all the boxes. Only thing is, Neil, I'm a long way down the track with another property around the corner, like you know, in the next suburb. It's off market. The owners, the, the agent's saying to me on that one, look, if we don't make a decision and sign contracts by close of business Friday, they're going to threaten to put that on the open market. We don't want to miss that opportunity. And I know it's only early days. I'm just speaking for the first time, but this looks like it's the one that ticks all the boxes. The one that you've got, Neil. How quickly can I get my client in? Because they're in decision-making mode today. Um, and that me asking that question means how can I get in before anybody else? So I'm already knocking down the door. How can I get in to make a decision on this property today so we don't miss that other opportunity? And then I go through it. I tee up the appointment time. My client goes through. And then when I start the negotiation later, assuming once we've done all the analysis and we've worked out it's a property of interest, the next phone call is, Neil, look, they do want to go ahead. They really love this property. It's their absolute preference. It's killer. You have to say preference otherwise agents just don't take you serious this is our preference otherwise they think you're just playing off two properties yeah we want to go for this property first but as i said to you on the phone call on thursday um we're a long way down the path on another property and i have to have something done before close of business tomorrow afternoon as i outlined to you a couple of days ago so it's not you basically what you're saying is neil it's not me i'm not putting an unrealistic time pressure on you it's another agent or another seller but what it's doing is it's forcing your hand um, or forcing your seller's hand to make a decision where they otherwise might not have. So they might say, no, nah, we want this weekend um, to run our first open for inspection. We've got heaps of I just had 30 inquiries already this week. And I'll say, that's fine, Neil, but we, we just won't be here on Monday. So I'm going to buy that other property. It's not an idle threat. We will buy that property. So we're going to make you a really fair offer. And I'm not going to lowball you. I've already exhausted the client. Um, they understand that they're not going to buy anything cheaply. Um, they're going to pay the right price for it. Now, I just use all these throwaway terms. I'm mm. still trying to buy it as cheaply as possible. <laughs> I absolutely want to underpay for it. But I'm leading you to that point of which I'm saying as a third party, I've done your job for you, Neil. I've exhausted this client. We're going to pay you a really fair offer. And the, where we see value sits at X. Now, if you came and said in that situation, um, Neil, uh, I've got a budget of 900 grand, so I can only go to nine. That's a very different conversation that you're going to have with your seller then if another buyer came along and said, Neil, we well, really love the property, it's my preference, um, but we only see value at nine based on these, you know, X comparable sales and what else is on the market. Now, when you go back and present that to your client, you're going to, the owners are going to say, Neil, thanks, Scott, very much for the first offer, but they can't afford our house. It's budget-driven. 
And the second one is they're going to have to say, okay, great, well, we'll have to take it serious because, you know, they've outlined all the comparable sales and mm-hmm. what else is there. We'll have to really weigh up that as a, as a real offer. So they're very two different outcomes. So it's, how, it's all in the setup. It starts from the very first conversation. Leverage is key because I can refer back to that property at all times. It's in the back of the mind. You can know for sure that the agent's told the seller because they want to get a deal done as well, <laughs> that this guy's got another property. They're really close to buying that other one. Um, and if you do it right, there's a real skill to doing this. And I, as I said to you before, I don't use this on every negotiation strategy, but it is something that's really key in the arsenal of a good negotiator. And if you can use that leverage, you'll, you'll find that you can control the process. You can do it on your terms. And very often it, it means I can save a lot of money for our clients. The trick is, the other trick is most people are unsure where to offer. So they're either going to overpay with that first offer or they're going to lowball it. And it's, and it's going to go nowhere. The problem mm-hmm. with lowballing is you're going to get a no from the vendor, which opens it up to they're going to take the open for inspection this weekend and compete with you with other buyer interests. But you're also going to learn nothing about the um, motivation to sell. So if you come in and say it's worth 900 and you come in at 830, you're going to get a flat no. Okay. If you come in within three to 5% of what your target price is based on what market value is. So if we think it's worth nine, I'm going to come in within three to 5% of that. In most instances, I either buy it on my first offer or I learn very quickly what the vendor's motivation is to sell it and they'll counter offer and I can close it in one step. And that's crucial. So that means it reduces my time in the negotiation process, but I also learn something the whole time. So if you turn away my 870, I know that I've got to pay 900. I know that I can get it done at 880. And if I get a counter offer out of that person, I know they're motivated to sell. Mm-hmm. Whereas if they just let it go and say, 870 is not enough, mate, then you know their expectations are well over 900 and that you can make a decision at that point to walk away. Mm-hmm. That's what I know very quickly. So when someone says to me, I'll wait a week or two or I'll see how it goes at auction for transparency, that's that's a you know the mugs game of doing it. I get in and get out on day one and I know that if the vendor's expectations are past that, then we just jog on to another property straight away. So we don't waste time in the process and that's crucial for your guys that if they're trying to find sites that have got value, there's no point digging in on a property that's never going to sell to you at the right price. You better to learn that instantly up front and move on. Go find another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, great. Good stuff. Uh, so in, with the first one that you mentioned, they've got the other property around the corner. Was there actually another property around the corner or was it just a negotiation Mate, tactic? Business, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with there's you, always another property around the corner. There's a, the deal of a lifetime comes around every week, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah there's plenty of opportunity in property. But no, I do. I mean, often I want my clients to have, um, I want my clients to genuinely have other options because mm-hmm. if you're putting all your eggs in one basket, that's where you get emotional about yeah. things and you're overpaid because you're not actively comparing apples and apples, right? You're just sort of taking one cross section of the market and saying, oh, there's great value there. So I'm going to I'm going to go and pay that price. Whereas you need to be playing this off against multiple different sellers if you can. Not always the case. Like in Perth, as you said at the moment, or WA, it's slim pickings. You're not going to have two or three options in the same week yeah. to trade them off. So you've just got to fight those battles as and when you can. But ideally, you have more than one option in front of you, and then you can really leverage that and mm-hmm. be truthful about it. But I don't think the truth really gets in the story. It gets in the way of a good story, mate. If you know what I mean. Like you, you, <laughs> you use it to your advantage. It's just a tool in your in your in your in your box there of tricks. Yeah, nice. Now, are you finding, Scott, like the more negotiations you do? Like you said, you've done over three and a half thousand negotiations now. When you ring a certain agent that you've dealt with previously, do they just think, oh shit, it's Scott again? <laughs> <laughs> this is a common um, misconception, I think. And other people have asked me this same question a lot. Um, I think, what? how do I answer this? The, the, the simple answer is it's three and a half thousand plus done deals. I'd be in the tens of thousands of negotiations yeah. because as an agent you're doing, you know, you're negotiating against six people on the same property which you only sell once. Mm. Um, so the negotiation game is, is deep. Um, but in terms of, you know, dealing with the same people or, you know, and shopping in the same locations, what you'll find, and this sounds pretty silly to maybe the outsiders, but good agents love working with someone like myself, um, you know, or like someone like you in your industry because you know what you're doing. They don't mm. have to educate you. Um, you can get there really quickly. At the end of the day, a seller that the agent's representing is only going to sell it at their lowest price that they're willing to let it go. And a buyer is only going to pay the highest price that the buyer is willing to go to. The rest is irrelevant, right? So when I'm negotiating against a good agent or experienced agent, they love it because we both just get there in microseconds. There's no fluff. There's yeah. no games. It's like, my client's prepared to sell for this. I'm prepared to pay that. And it is back and forth. There's a bit of bluffing and game playing as there always is. That's the game. 
Um, there's a bit of song and dance around that if you do it well. But but in essence, you know, we get there really quickly and they much prefer to do that than trying to educate a first-home buyer or someone's emotionally invested and playing them off against multiple properties and, you know, no idea of how the process really works. So, yeah, they, I think they, they like it. Um, I don't make a big song and dance about... Um, winning either again against an agent like the ideal goal is to finish with everyone feeling like it's as close to a win-win as possible now that's making them feel like they've had a win it's not a win-win situation i want to win i don't want to i don't want to leave a dollar left on the table <laughs> I, I absolutely want to destroy them in a negotiation for the client but i want to make them feel like they've had a win and that is one of the key issues with australian property buyers neil i think is that Agents, they train really hard in scripts and dialogues, and I did this for so long, and I coached agents and coached buyers agents to do this as well, into making the buyer feel like they've um, they've done really well for themselves in that process. So, for example, let's say it's an expressions of interest campaign or it's a prior to auction prior, you know, sale and it's a contract race in my office and there's five of you that are coming in with your sealed bids or your signed contract at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, Right. Everyone knows they've got to be over 600,000. Four of those five buyers might come in at 600, 601, 606, 609, 612, right? And someone will come in at 681,000. Well, the thing that I say to the person at 681 is, mate, Neil, you've done so well, mate. You've just outpit the other person. You couldn't <laughs> believe how close it was. They were at 675 and then they pushed up to 660, uh, 678 and you ended up beating them by three grand. Can you believe it? That, you know, you've been doing this for three months and it came down just to three grand. You're walking away there doing these ones, off down the pub, telling your friends how you've you know, expertly controlled the process. In the meantime, you just overpaid by 75 grand yeah. or 70 grand. So that's exactly how the game works behind the scenes. So... People don't realise how much they're overpaying and it's a badge of honour in Australia to go to your dinner party or your barbecue and say, you know, I bought my own house or I did this and Arnie Beryl, you know, out-negotiated an agent and saved 20 grand. Arnie Beryl didn't out-negotiate an agent. The agent just made Arnie <laughs> Beryl feel like she was special. <laughs> she got 20 grand off the asking price while she overpaid by 30. Mm. Yeah, so there's a whole art to this and there's a game that's going on behind the scenes. So this goes back to the comment I said to you before, like unless you know how the game works from the inside out, you, you, you're not playing the game right. Yeah, true, true. So Scott, how do people find out more about you, the service you offer? Um, how do they contact you for a chat if they want to find out if you can help them with their negotiations? Sure, yeah. So my number is everywhere on the internet, so it should be reasonably easy to find <laughs> if you want to badge me after hours on the weekends. Um, no, hellohouse.co, um, and house is the German spelling, H-A-U-S, so hellohouse.co, and you can come and speak to the team anytime. Um, I do lots of content for free, so I put out as much as possible to give away my inside tricks and tips, so if you follow that on LinkedIn or Instagram. Um, and then, you know, briefly we spoke about it before, but last year I wrote a... Um, first of its kind course called Get Buy Ready, which takes people on a three-hour video journey or a written journey um, through 44 lessons, the easy adult uh, learning size lessons about how to find, analyse, negotiate and transact. So it's, it's broken down to those four key subjects. Um, I'd be very happy to, to give that away to any of your listeners that are interested so if they want to hit me up and um, and let me know that they've come through from this podcast. We'd happily um, give them access to that course. And, um, um, yeah, I spent a long time kind of, you know, data dumping out of my brain to put as much of that as I could into that um, course. Yeah, that's incredible because uh, that you actually, there's a retail price behind that that you normally charge people. Is that right? Yeah, it's $995. But if you've got people that are seriously interested in educating themselves and learning, then I'm seriously interested about helping people, you know, transform the way they buy. And yeah, you'll, they'll learn a lot about it, I'm, I'm sure, and get some good insider tips. So I'd be happy to give it away for free. Fantastic, mate. We will put the all your contact details in the show notes below so that people can find you nice and easy. Awesome. Scott, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up. Um, is there any questions I should have asked you that I haven't asked you? I don't know, mate. Yeah, it's a big, deep, dark hole when you get to negotiations. <laughs> no, I think we had to cover covered off of this. If you think of anything, I'm always happy to jump on and have another chat with, with, um, with you anytime. But thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. It was good fun. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for listening. Make sure you tune in the same time next week so you stay up to date with all the cash flow positive property updates.